Hi everyone, now we're on chapter 21, the immune system, innate and adaptive body defenses. You'll see here that there's a part A, at slide number 59 will be part B. Because this is quite a complicated um, discussion, the immune system is, is quite complex and they're learning more and more about it all the time. Uh, we've, I've split this into two parts, part A and part B. It's one PowerPoint script, um, but again, at slide number 59, I'm going to start a separate audio lecture. So this, will, this lecture will just be on part A, and you'll find another lecture for part B. So what is immunity? Immunity is the resistance to disease. The human immune system has two basic intrinsic systems. Innate defense system, this is one that you're born with, and it, but it's very nonspecific. And then you've got your adaptive defense system, and this is what the body learns over time as it encounters uh, various pathogens um, or some type of a foreign cell that enters the body. It'll actually, the body will learn how to specifically fight that uh, invader. So the, the first one, the innate defense system, actually is broken into two major lines of defense. One would be the surface barriers, which would be the skin and mucosae and all of the um, types of chemicals and activities that these um, the organs use actually to keep pathogens out of the body. Then you've got your antimicrobial proteins, uh, phagocytes, and etc. Uh, that are present in case the pathogen enters the tissues, so it, it breaches this barrier and gets into the body. This uh, process is called inflammation. It's very important uh, to fight infection, but again, it's not real specific to a particular kind of pathogen. The, so those would actually be your first two lines of defenses. You can go back here um, to this one. Uh, you can see one and two. Here's your first two lines of defense. And then the third line of defense it would be your adaptive defense system. This uh, system attacks particular foreign substances in specific ways. It does take longer to react, and it's composed of two different types of uh, immunities. One would be the humoral immunity that is um, provided by what we call B cells or B lymphocytes. And then you've got cellular immunity that is um, carried out by T cells or T lymphocytes. So this is a figure 21.1, an overview of the innate and adaptive defenses. And I numbered the lines of defense here. So in your innate defenses, those you're born with, and they're actually pretty, they, they act pretty quickly in response to invasion, um, but they're not real specific. Number one would be your surface barriers, uh, skin and mucous membranes, including any chemicals, uh, present, like such as the stomach acid, for example, um, and also some flushing effects. Things where if something enters into your, you know, onto the mucous membrane, it's going to cause an increase in mucus, and it will uh, lead to things such as sneezing if it's in the nose, coughing if it's in the upper airway, um, etc. That is the surface barrier. First line of defense. Second line of defense would be internal. And so this is if that barrier is breached, um, and the, this line of defense includes phagocytes, uh, the natural killer cells in the body, um, inflammation, antimicrobial proteins, and fever. Actually, all of these together forms what we call inflammation, and we'll, I'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail later on. The third line of defense would be this adaptive defense system that the body is able to develop, and it consists primarily of the humoral immunity by B cells or B lymphocytes, and then your cellular immunity that's carried out by the T cells or T lymphocytes. Okay, so let's look a little bit more closely at your innate defenses. 
The first line of defense is the surface barriers. And you may remember, if you've ever worked in healthcare, um, or you might have even heard this, that the most important way to prevent infection is to wash your hands and to make sure that you're, um, you're not you know, getting things onto your mucous membranes. Um, things even such as rubbing your eyes um, can spread uh, the common cold virus, et cetera, and other kinds of respiratory infection. And if your skin or mucous membrane has any kind of abrasion or it's not intact, uh, pathogens can get into your body much more easily. So it's really important to have an intact skin and mucous membrane. And also the secretions associated with these um, the skin and the mucous membranes will help fight, keep uh, pathogens out. So not only is there a physical barrier, but the, it's uh, actually like the skin has keratin, keratinocytes. Remember the outer layer of the skin has, um, in the epidermis, you've got keratin-filled cells. That, that's a protein that's really tough. It's uh, resistant to weak acids, bases, bacterial enzymes, and toxins. And the mucosa, uh, the mucous membranes in the body are similar. There's also these protective chemicals, the acidity of the skin actually, and secretions. Also, you may um, know that, you may understand that when you sweat, uh, perspiration is very high in salt, it's very salty, and that salt itself actually kills bacteria. But there's uh, chemicals in the skin and mucous membrane that kill bacteria, in saliva, the mucus, in tears, there's um, a substance known as lysozyme, which kills bacteria. Also, there are defensins. These are antimicrobial peptides, little protein fragments that will fight infection. And again, the bacteriostatic chemicals that's in sebum from the sebaceous glands. And there's a um, substance known as dermcidin in your sweat. And of course, sodium chloride, as I mentioned before. In the respiratory system, there are mucus-coated hairs in the nose and also cilia in the upper respiratory tract. I like to also include what's known as flushing, you know, F-L-U-S-H-I-N-G. So when something enters uh, the body on a mucous membrane, it causes that mucous membrane to greatly increase the amount of mucus, and then uh, the body has ways to get that out. So if you've got a uh, something irritating in the nose, it'll um, cause increase in mucus and you'll it'll cause some sneezing. If it's lower down in the um, bronchi, for example, it will stimulate the cough reflex. And even with the stomach, the upper GI system is something is offensive. It will lead to uh, vomiting in, in an attempt to rid the body of that um, pathogen or lower down in the gastrointestinal tract, it could lead to an increase in peristalsis in, in the um, intestines, and that would increase, um, it would be resulting in diarrhea. So the respiratory system is, is special in that it has these mucus-coated hairs in the nose and cilia that can trap mucus and help get it out of the body. Now, if the surface barriers are breached, in other words, microorganisms invades, this will activate the second line of defense, and it's called inflammation. And we could also say this is the inflammatory response. It includes uh, phagocytes. These are general white blood cells, such as macrophages or large eaters, that will actually approach the foreign cell or the pathogen and engulf it. They're kind of like amoebas. They can stick out these little pseudopods, that means fake feet and engulf the invader and um, break it apart and neutralize it, get rid of it. There's also another type of cell called a natural killer cell that has a similar function to phagocytes. And there's even antimicrobial proteins that the body uh, produces in response to um, when an invader uh, gets through those surface barriers. Fever. Fever is, is very interesting because when the body temperature rises to about 102 degrees Fahrenheit or even um, up to like 38 degrees Celsius, that is considered a fever where the body temperature has risen. 
they have found that fever actually inhibits bacterial multiplication and so it's actually helping the body to fight infection and it's stimulated by signals to the hypothalamus and the brain that can is like your thermostat so it kind of turns up the thermostat so that the body's uh, core body temperature will be higher when the body tissues are injured it's going to result in the inflammatory response this prevents the spread of damaging agents and it disposes cell debris and pathogens. It also alerts the adaptive immune system and it sets the stage, stage for repair of that tissue once the infection has been uh, neutralized. Now there, actually if you're working in healthcare, you need to be able to recognize the cardinal signs and the main signs of inflammation. And this would be acute inflammation, redness, heat, swelling, pain, and also impairment of function. And so we're going to look at what would cause redness. It's actually vasodilation. The blood vessels just open up to that area and allow more blood in, the, in that region. So naturally it's going to look um, erythematous, which is the uh, medical term for redness, the color red. It will be warm or hotter because there's more of the blood going there. It will also be swollen because the capillaries become more leaky to fluid. And so the tissue fluid will come out from the capillaries uh, into the tissues and cause swelling. We also call that edema. It will also be painful and pain there is for a number of reasons. Just the, the swelling um, can press on nerve endings and lead to pain, but there's also chemicals that are released that uh, causes that area to be painful. And as a result of all this, you're going to have some impairment of function. And in a sense, this actually, impairment of function, may help the body heal because it's kind of limiting the, the, the movement there and that will um, allow the body to heal more quickly. So the chemicals that are released into extracellular fluid by the injured tissues, the immune cells, and the blood cells um, are going to lead to this inflammatory response. There's macrophages uh, and also epithelial cells that release what we call toll-like receptors. And I'm not going to talk a lot in a lot of detail about these, but they've discovered there's about 11 types of these TLRs, they're very specific. The TLRs, toll-like receptors, will lead to the um, release of cytokines. Cytokines are chemicals that will greatly increase the inflammatory response or inflammation. So there's other kinds of inflammatory mediators. These are chemicals um, in the body that are produced. Some are called kinins. Others are known as prostaglandins and also complement. These chemicals will dilate local arterioles. An arteriole is merely a small artery. So as the blood vessels get smaller and smaller uh, away from the heart, you've got major arteries, uh, the, the arteries get smaller, eventually give rise to arterioles before it becomes the capillary bed. Um, but, and these arterioles have smooth muscle in their um, lining. So this dilate means they'll open up. These local arterioles open up or dilate. And also the local capillaries become more permeable. So there's an increase in local capillary permeability, therefore allowing fluids to leak out. Not the blood cells, so it's not bleeding, but it's just the tissue fluid that can leak out. These chemicals also will attract leukocytes. Leukocyte means white blood cell, and there's a variety of them that are involved. So this uh, increased capillary permeability, it's when fluid um, clotting factors, antibodies, and complement can actually leak out from the blood. So it's not just fluid, but there's other little chemicals that can get out. This um, increased cap capillary permeability where the fluid with all of these uh, good things right here uh, leak out. This is known as edema, the swelling that occurs from the tissue fluid 
accumulation. You get the local swelling that uh, presses on those nerve endings leading to pain. And again, um, there's some toxins, prostaglandins, and kinins that can also just directly uh, increase the, um, the pain in that area. It activates those local uh, nerve endings. So also, um, but when this material is gathering around this area, the inflammation uh, and the edema, the tissue fluid will then move into the lymphatics. And I talked about the lymphatics, which are the lymphatic system vessels um, at that area. And that, that fluid will be taken up into the lymphatics. Now it's a fluid inside known as lymph to be carried back to the circulatory system. At the same time, of course, you have uh, clotting factors that are going to form a fibrin mesh. So if there's a wound, you know, an actual um, opening in the skin somewhere, uh, you'll also have bleeding, of course, and the body will need to stop the bleeding and heal the repair. So um, it starts out with some clotting factors and platelets. We'll be talking about this later when we get to the discussion of blood. But keep in mind, you get uh, the body will set up to protect itself from infection, but at the same time, it needs to stop the bleeding if there is a major injury there. Um, this fibrin mesh will provide a scaffold for repair and will also isolate the area. And this is a kind of a complex table, but it shows you all the steps of inflammation. Now, this is just showing that this person picked up a, a beaker here and cut themselves. And so uh, it's called tissue injury. Um, and they're showing uh, the initial stimulus right here um, is actually the pink. Um, and then you get the release of inflammatory chemicals such as complement, kinase, prostaglandins. It actually mentions histamine right here. H-I-S-T-A-M-I-N-E. It didn't mention that earlier. But histamine actually is a chemical that causes further um, dilation, dilation of the blood vessels and leakiness of the capillaries. You might have heard of an antihistamine in the respiratory system. Will, when histamine is released, it actually can um, cause a, more of an inflammatory response, and an antihistamine fights the activity of this to reduce the swelling um, and mucus production, etc. But anyway, these are inflammatory chemicals. It also, this tissue injury will also release leukocytosis inducing factor. And that's a, a big word. Leukocytosis means it's, it's drawing the red blood, the white, excuse me, the white blood cells to that area, leukocytes. Um, with this inflammation, you get the arterioles dilate, you get increased capillary permeability, and you have chemicals here that will attract neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, which of course are all leukocytes, are white blood cells. There's actually chemicals uh, released and the white blood cells are attracted to it. Uh, this is called chemotaxis, where they're actually attracted by these chemicals to go to that area. So over here again, the arterioles dilate, you get local hyperemia, that means increased blood flow, and this is gonna to lead to your heat, or warmth in that area, and redness. Um, and this actually will be locally increased temperature, um, which actually serves to help healing because it increases the metabolic rate of those cells. The increased capillary permeability, um, it means that the capillaries are gonna leak the fluid, it's showing little droplets here. Again, it's not blood, it's just fluid. We call it exudate. Um, the, pro, the leaked protein-rich fluid goes into the tissue spaces. This is going to lead to pain and swelling and possible temporary impairment of function. And that, of course, will help with the healing. Um, just the fact that these inflammatory chemicals attract neutrophils, monocytes, and uh, lymphocytes, um, they're actually giving a little side uh, area right here um, that shows that it kind of ties in with the leukocytes that migrate to the injured area um, over here. Uh, the, ca the capillary leaking fluid, it actually gives a little side bridge here showing that leaked clotting proteins form interstitial clots that will wall off the area. Uh, and this is actually kind of interesting. So this is actually 
some of this will lead to the stopping the bleeding, but also you may have heard that sometimes um, when there's an infection, it kind of walls itself off. And so this is referring to the fact that uh, clots between the cells will wall off the area to prevent injury to the surrounding tissue. And so that keeps that infection from spreading, helping promote healing. Now over here, this leukocytosis inducing factor, um, this means there's an increased numbers of white blood cells in the, uh, in the bloodstream. The leukocytes migrate to the injured area, including all of these. Then you have what's called margination. That's when the leukocytes cling to the capillary walls. Diapedesis, that means they stick their foot little extensions out and can squeeze through the capillary walls. And they will go to the area and uh, engage in phagocytosis of the pathogens and the dead tissue cells. So they'll eat them up and destroy them. So this is going to be happening by your neutrophils, short-term, and then macrophages, long-term. This actually leads to the formation of pus. So if you've ever seen an infected, like a boil, for example, or another type of infection, a boil is actually quite clearly some where the body has walled off an infection. The actual yellowish pus is kind of a collection of uh, debris that's been destroyed by the macrophages uh, and what other types of white blood cells. Now we get that debris cleared up and that will increase the speed at which you heal. Phagocytes. Uh, neutrophils are the most abundant type of phagocyte. These neutrophils actually become phagocytic and then they will die. They do their job and then they will disappear. Macrophages then will develop from monocytes. Free macrophages are just hanging out. They're, they're dwelling in the tissue spaces. There's also some fixed macrophages that are permanent residents of particular organs. So these are like the soldiers that are stationed out in the field and they're monitoring uh, to see if there's any advancement of the enemy. Phagocyte mobilization. Uh, this process, it, it, there's a lot of steps uh, that happen and scientists have actually described them in detail. Phagocyte mobilization, this means the neutrophils lead because they're so plentiful and then the macrophages will follow. So both of these types of cells will engage in phagocytosis. If the inflammation is due to pathogens, there's this chemical called complement which will be activated. And then it also the body will um, engage in, uh, it will alert the adaptive immunity segment, the B cells, which will uh, form antibody. So this part of the adaptive immune system will be activated by uh, other cells that are right there on the scene, such as um, neutrophils and macrophages. So these are the different steps, actually, in uh, phagocyte mobilization. Leukocytosis and uh, margination and diapedesis uh, and chemotaxis, all of these were described in the figure earlier, where the leukocytes are called over to the site, um, actually, by chemicals, okay? So the white blood cells will increase in number and they will go to the region of infection. Margination means they go along the side of the capillary, the, the vessel wall. Diapedesis, they actually squeeze through the capillary walls. And then chemotaxis is describing the chemicals that are released locally are actually attracting the white blood cells to come to fight the infection. And this is showing you uh, an illustration of it. Um, here is leukocytosis. There's a lot of neutrophils. They, they get produced by the bone marrow as all blood cells are produced in the bone marrow. But the white blood cells, such as neutrophils, they're going to increase in number. They enter the, bloods, uh, the blood and then they margination. They cling to the capillary wall. Diapedesis, look at their squeezing right through that capillary wall. And then um, Chemotaxis, they're going to follow the chemical trail. So these little green things right here represent uh, invading bacteria that were on this little tack right here, got right through into the skin. Bacteria are here, and so these little um, 
neutrophils are going to follow that chemical trail that's released to go destroy, seek and destroy these bacteria. Phagocytosis, this is when the phagocyte actually adheres to the particle. So even once that uh, neutrophil or macrophage reaches the bacterium or the foreign cell, it will actually adhere to the particle, the foreign particle. Now there's some bacteria actually that can evade this adherence because they have this little slippery capsule that the phagocyte can't get a hold of it. Um, but anyway, the, with the phagocyte, it has cytoplasmic extensions that bind and engulf that particle, and this now they call it a phagosome. The phagosome, will, uh, which would be the phagocyte fused to the bacteria, for example, the invader, this phagosome itself now fuses with a lysosome, and you may remember a lysosome is a, um, a little vesicle in the cell that contains digestive enzymes that will be released to break apart any kind of foreign um, particle or pathogen. So when the phagosome fuses with the lysosome, it becomes a phagolysosome. Now, the pathogens will be killed because the chemicals in this lysosome, they're very acidic. They will acidify and digest and destroy the pathogen. Then, they will, at once the pathogen is destroyed and broken apart through exocytosis, the residual or the little pieces, the molecules will just be uh, spit out by that uh, cell, by the phagocyte. And this is showing the steps. Phagocyte adheres to the pathogens. It will form a pseudopod around it and will actually uh, completely contain it to form this vesicle. And this is called a phagocytic vesicle or a phagosome. Then the lysosome comes over there and it will fuse to the phagosome. And now it becomes a uh, phagolysosome. And this lysosome is is secreting these, uh, or it actually contains these enzymes that break apart the pathogen. Uh, the lysosomal enzymes are just digesting the particles, leaving a residual, and then here's exocytosis, where the vesicle travels over to the cell membrane of the phagocyte and just spits it right out through exocytosis. And these are harmless now because the pathogen is all broken up. And this is an electron photomicrograph that shows, actually, this is actually happening. It's a scanning electron micrograph. They actually colorize it. The image doesn't come out in color like this, but it's showing this um, macrophage, and it's using cytoplasmic extensions to pull these rod-shaped bacteria toward it, and it will engulf it and then fuse it together with a lysosome and break them apart and render them harmless. There's another kind of cell called a natural killer T cell. This is a very specialized cell. Um, it will actually attack any cell that does not have the self receptor. A self receptor would be uh, like a name tag if you're working in a, an industry where you are required to wear a name tag that identifies you as belonging to that company. If you do not have that identity tag, you're considered um, foreign or non-self. So T cells will learn how to recognize cells that do not have what's known as a self receptor. I'm putting it in air quotes. This is going to lead to apoptosis. Apoptosis is actually cell suicide. So it will sacrifice itself for the good of the cause, meaning for the health of the entire body. So a T, natural killer T cell will increase the, the chances of apoptosis. It will actually lead to apoptosis of cancer cells or virus-infected cells because these are actually cells, your own cells, that have become either become cancerous or virus-infected. And the natural killer T cells can find them, identify them, and cause them to self-destruct. Natural killer cells, T cells, also secrete chemicals that will increase that inflammatory response. 
There's a variety of antimicrobial proteins such as interferons and complement proteins that are also involved with inflammation and these actually a attack the pathogen directly. These will also hinder microorganism cell division. Uh, interferons are a type of immune modulating protein that are secreted actually by that viral infected cell. Remember, a virus is not considered a living organism. It's a, an entity that needs to get inside of a living cell and takes over that cell's operation to make copies of itself. And so how does the body fight a virus if it's inside of one of your very own body cells? Well, that body cell that's infected by a virus will start secreting what's known as an interferon to say, hey, I'm infected with this virus, it's an abnormal cell, and I need to be destroyed, otherwise these viruses will begin to multiply and infect more cells. And this is actually a summary showing the interferon mechanism against viruses. So we start here where the virus enters a cell, and then, um, this is really, it's just the, the um, nuclear material, DNA or RNA, that actually gets inside of the cell and then it multiplies and then um, it actually, this is going to cause interferon genes to switch on in that cell. And then the cell is going to produce interferon molecules and then, and the, even though this virus has multiplied and is released, it's going to try to infect other cells. And so this is this was the host cell one, the first one to be infected. Um, it's going to be killed, but at the same time, it's going to make this interferon that's released, and this interferon is going to stimulate another cell, host cell 2, um, to turn on its genes for antiviral proteins. So host cell 2, um, this is going to bind to the interferon from cell 1, and it's going to induce the synthesis of an uh, protective proteins by other cells. So it's really pretty amazing that limits the spread of that virus to other cells. Um, there's another uh, system of chemicals. It's called the complement system or complement. It's about 20 different blood proteins that circulate in your blood in an inactive form. You're going to find out that there's a lot of things that will circulate in your bloodstream in what is known as the inactive form. There's also enzymes in the intestinal tract that are going to be there in the inactive form and they will be activated only when appropriate. So these blood proteins of the complement system are hanging around. They're just there, ready if they're needed, but they're in the inactive form. Complement is the major mechanism to destroy foreign substances. It unleashes inflammatory chemicals. Inflammation will then start to localize and fight that infection or, limp, or even if it's a foreign substance, like a, a toxin that's produced by some kind of a bacterium. Um, this complement system also will cause some cells to die. So it kills some cells by lysis Lysis means it's going to burst. So um, that's how these cells are going to be killed, is that they're actually going to be ruptured. It, this complement system also enhances both the innate and the adaptive defenses, both inflammation, which is the part of your innate uh, immunity that's going to be activated by complement, and then your adaptive defenses, which we're going to be talking about pretty much in depth in, uh, at the end of Part A and the entire Part B of Chapter 21. Um, there's also some complement activation inhibitors. So the body has ways to inhibit responses because when there is inflammation, when it's not appropriate, it can actually lead to death. And so the body has to fight when appropriate but not allow further damage or, in air quotes, friendly fire. You, you want to control the situation so the body doesn't damage surrounding tissues and become overzealous in battling the infection. 
fever. Fever is an abnormally high body temperature. It's systemic. This means throughout the body. It's uh, when leukocytes and macrophages release what are called pyrogens. Um, you probably heard of pyrex, that kind of um, glassware that's resistant to very high heat. Pyro means fire or heat. So these release a chemical called a pyrogen. The pyrogens will enter the bloodstream, of course, and they go to the hypothalamus of the brain that is the body's thermostat, and it can actually set the temperature higher. Why? Why would the body want to have a fever? It just seems very uncomfortable, and it, um, if it gets too high, particularly in, uh, if it goes, if it becomes, if it goes up very rapidly in young children, like babies around from the age of like over 15 months is probably the peak, and their temperature begins to rise very quickly, it can lead to febrile convulsions. So, and if the body temperature goes extremely high, it can lead to death. But a fever at, will, a higher body temperature of a couple degrees will actually cause the liver and the spleen to sequester or gather iron and zinc, which is needed by the microorganisms. So it robs those microorganisms of iron and zinc to limit their ability to reproduce. It also increases the body's metabolic rate, so it will be more effectively fighting the infection. Now we're on the adaptive defenses, and it starts here, and this will continue through part B. This is the a specific part of the immune system. So the adaptive immune system is very specific against particular infectious agents or abnormal cells. Um, during You have an increased inflammatory response and it actually will activate complement and then it's going, uh, what happens is this increased inflammatory response and the activation of complement is going to prime or alert the adaptive defenses. And this can take some time. In the meantime, you might be sick with an infection. But the adaptive defense is very specific, systemic, meaning it, it's, it happens throughout the body and it will have a memory. There's two separate but overlapping arms. One is called humoral. Humoral is referring to chemicals in the bloodstream, and you might not think of antibodies as chemicals, but they are. It's a type of, it's a protein that's produced by body cells that's sent out into the bloodstream and that can go to anywhere in the body. But the humoral or antibody mediated side of the uh, adaptive defense, this is actually uh, initiated and carried out by B cells and then you have the cellular or cell-mediated branch by the T cells. So humoral immunity or antibody-mediated, these are antibodies produced by B cells that circulate. They actually will bind to the target cell or the pathogen or foreign cell. It will temporarily inactivate it. It will mark that cell or the toxin that's produced by a bacterium. Um, it's called humoral immunity because it has extracellular targets. So these are like with um, other, the these are chemicals that are produced by the body that will find the invader, but then it will respond to an extracellular target. Cellular immunity or cell mediated, these are by the T cells or T lymphocytes. These will act directly on the target cell to kill it and also indirectly by releasing chemicals um, to increase the response or activating other responses to the infection. Cellular immunity has cellular targets. So now we need to talk about antigens. An antigen is not something of your, of your own body. It's actually uh, it's something that enters the body, it breaches the, the surface barriers, gets into the body, and it will allow um, the body to mobilize adaptive immune responses. The antigens are the target, so it's some type of a, a protein on a foreign cell, um, 
a, a bacterium or some kind of a organic toxin that's produced by uh, the uh, an invader, a pathogen. These are the targets. Most of the antigens are large, complex molecules that the body can identify as non-self. There's two kinds of uh, major groups of antigens. There's a complete antigen. These actually stimulate immunogenicity. That means an increased proliferation of specific lymphocytes, and it also stimulates reactivity. Um, this is one. These will actually react with activated lymphocytes and antibodies, the complete antigen. Examples of a complete antigen would be foreign proteins, polysaccharides, lipids, and nucleic acids. So any of these foreign large molecules can be a, uh, serve as a complete antigen to uh, signal to the body that it, it's foreign, it needs to be destroyed. There's also something known as an haptin. This is an incomplete an antigen. Haptins would be peptides, it's little small fragments of um, amino acids. Remember peptides, uh, polypeptides form proteins. So a little fragment um, with some amino acids in it, uh, nucleotides, and some hormones, little bitty molecules. These are considered incomplete antigens. They may activate the immune response. And examples of this is the toxin that um, is produced by poison ivy, animal dander, detergents and cosmetics. And not everyone has a sensitivity to these, but of course a reaction to these can are considered an allergic response. Most people, by the way, are highly allergic to the um, chemicals that's released by poison ivy. Now, there is something known as antigenic determinant. There, this means that there's only a part of an entire antigen that is um, recognized by the body that's actually targeted is called the antigenic determinant. These are the ones that are immunogenic. That means these little parts of the antigen stimulate the body's immune response. Antibodies and lymphocytes receptors will bind to these antigenic determinants. They will see them and they will bind to them. So this is a figure that shows an antigen that has these little uh, antigenic determinants. So they're like little markers on this antigen, little places where the body will recognize it's foreign and that's going to stimulate the immune system. And it actually is going to allow various antibodies to actually bind. So that an antibody will be designed to um, bind to the antigenic determinant. So this is showing an antigenic binding site here, and then this is the antibody that binds to it. You see how it's kind of like a triangle shape? Over here, you've got another antigenic determinant shaped like this, and this type of antibody will bind to that because it's shaped just the right way. Antibody B will bind to this antigenic determinant. We actually have self-antigens. Now, all of our cells have self markers. Okay, so we could say that marker, that little protein on our cells, it's not really an antigen because we recognize it as self. We should not attack that antigen. Now it's considered a self marker. Okay, our self antigens are not antigenic to, uh, to, eat, to our cells, but they are to others. So in other words, if you, you have your own set of specific self antigens, we call those MHC, they're major histocompatibility proteins. Um, and this set of markers is your set of markers. And it tells your body, these cells are mine, they belong here. But if that cell was, was to be transplanted in another individual, that individual would, would recognize those foreign proteins as foreign or non-self and serve as antigens so that their body will now develop antibodies against those antigens and will attack those cells and destroy them. Um, major histocompatibility 
pro complex, and this is showing you here uh, the whole name of it. They're actually glycoproteins, so they're a protein with a little um, sugar part to it. Um, um, and actually, the um, glycoproteins are coded by genes, and your genes are called the major histocompatibility complex in your DNA. It's unique to each person. So um, that is an explanation of major histocompatibility complex proteins. And they look at these very, very carefully when an individual needs to have some kind of a tissue transplant. Okay, so cells of the adaptive immune system, there's three types. Two of them are your lymphocytes. One, the B lymphocytes or B cells that form humoral or antibody-mediated immunity. And then you've got your T lymphocytes or T cells that form the cellular immunity. And then there's another type of cell called an antigen-presenting cell or APC. These are not specific, but it does play an essential helping role to help um, the cells recognize antigens and form a specific response to neutralize the antigen on that foreign uh, invader. Now there are several steps with lymphocyte development, maturation, and activation. And I'm not going to expect that you know all the details of it because we could actually have a whole uh, semester course on such a thing. I think there's five. Um, first of all, all blood cells originate in the red bone marrow. Red blood cells, all the white blood cells, and the platelets. But during lymphocyte, which is a specific kind of white blood cell, when they develop, they first start out, they're born basically in your red bone marrow. Then they need to mature. And so the B cells and the T cells uh, mature in different locations actually in the body. Then, once they're mature, they will seed secondary lymphoid organs. And in, so in other words, they're planted in our secondary lymphoid organs and out into the circulation to be monitoring for infection. Then they, they can, will become fully mature when they uh, encounter an antigen. So once they encounter this infection, they will see this antigen and they will then be activated. Then they will proliferate, they'll multiply, and then they will become differentiated to only uh, identify that particular antigen if the body at a later date encounters that same antigen. In other words, that very same pathogen. During maturation, lymphocytes have to be educated to become mature. The B cells mature in the bone marrow, think of B bone marrow, and the T cells mature in the thymus. So there's different locations where B cells and T cells mature. These uh, cells must develop what we call immunocompetence. That means that they have to recognize one specific antigen by binding to it. It will display one type, unique type of antigen receptor. So each type of possible antigen that gets in the body, the body will then be able to develop a specific kind of a cell that will recognize it immediately and neutralize it before it can make you sick. Not only do, do these cells have to recognize a foreign antigen, but they also have to be self-tolerant. They cannot respond to self-antigens. Now when things go wrong, there can be a situation where the body will begin to see its own cells, cells as foreign, and that's called an autoimmune disorder. And we don't want that to be happening because the body will begin to destroy its own cells. So ideally, when these cells mature, they will develop self-tolerance. T cells. T cells mature in the thymus under both positive and negative selection tests. And this is described right here. So in other words, positive selections. The T cells must recognize major histocompatibility proteins, your own, yourself, major histocompatibility um, proteins. And this is showing an antigen-presenting thymic cell and a developing T cell. 
And so failure to recognize your self MHC results in apoptosis by this particular T cells. Like, no, it's no good because it's recognizing your own cells as foreign and can start destroying your own cells. But if there's a cell that here that will recognize your self major compatibility protein, it's going to survive. And now this cell will proceed to the next step, which is called negative selection. So T cells, um, so first of all, it's going to recognize the self antigen. So that's good. It passes that test. Then it's going to uh, go on to the next one where it must not recognize self antigens. Recognition of a self antigen will result in apoptosis. This eliminates self reactive T cells that could lead to autoimmune disease. Failure to recognize or not bind tightly to the self antigen results in survival and continued maturation. Now this is very highly summarized right here. There's many, many details in the middle. Just keep in mind that there's quite a few ways that T cells have to be selected um, so that they can do the job. They cannot, um, they, first of all, they have to be able to recognize self um, MHC proteins and then um, they need to understand that they should not be destroyed, um, but they need to only recognize antigens that are not self. B cells mature in the bone marrow, red bone marrow. They po they're positively selected if they can successfully make antigen receptors. Um, now here, this is talking about um, seeding secondary lymphoid organs and, and circulation. So immunocompetent or mature B and T cells, um, they're not, they haven't yet been exposed to an antigen. We, we say they're naive. They're sent from the primary lymphoid organs to seed secondary lymphoid organs. And then um, they will actually, um, when they first encounter an antigen, okay, they're actually will then be selected. So when a naive lymphocyte first encounters an antigen, it's selected for further development, and that is called clonal selection. Table 21.3 is an overview of B and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes, the type of response, humoral, these do secrete antibody. Their primary targets are extracellular pathogens, such as bacteria, fungi, parasites, some viruses that are in the extracellular fluid, not yet inside of a cell. Um, their site of origin is red bone marrow. Site of maturation is also red bone marrow. The effector cells are called plasma cells, and they do have memory cells, memory B cells. These uh, are called mem memory cells. And so that kind of keeps a memory of the encounter of the type of antibody that is made in response to a specific antigen. T lymphocytes, this is the cellular immune response. They do not produce antibodies. Their targets are intracellular pathogens, in other words, virus infected cells, and also cancer cells, and also foreign cells. So during a transplant, if there's a problem, it's the T lymphocytes, which attacks those foreign cells. Um, also, the site of origin, they're born basically in the red bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus. The effector cells, the cells that actually do the killing of the cells are called cytotoxic T cells um, or killer T cells. Uh, cytotoxic T cell has a little subscript of a C after the T. Also, there's helper T cells and regulatory T cells, and there are also memory cells. So there's four types of T lymphocytes, the killer or cytotoxic T cells, one, the helper T cells, number two, they have a little H there, regulatory or suppressor T cells, they actually call off the, the battle. Those are a third type, and then there's also memory T cells, which we'll see later. Antigen presenting cells, these actually engulf the antigens and they'll present the fragments to T cells in order for the T cell to recognize it. There's major, the major types of antigen presenting cells are dendritic cells. These would be found in your connective tissues in the epidermis. Macrophages are in your connective tissues and lymphoid organs. And also 
B cells can do that. This is an electron, a scanning electron micrograph that is showing you a dendritic cell. Dendritic has to do with it, it has all these little extensions that are sticking out. B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are activated when antigens um, have, uh, are bound. They, they get uh, possibly an antigen presenting cell which will bind to that antigen. Um, the B lymphocyte also will present the antigen to the helper T cells to assist their own activation. Uh, the B, B lymphocytes multiply and differentiate into effector cells. The effector cells are those that cause an effect. They actually produce the antibody. Those are called plasma cells. We'll see that later. So most of the B cells, here it is, a pla most B cells become plasma cells. These plasma cells secrete specific antibodies, about 2,000 molecules per second for about four to five days, and then they will die. They self-destruct. The antibodies circulate and bind to free antigens and mark them for destruction. The clone cells that don't become plasma cells, they will then stay there to become memory cells. So this forms a memory of the exact encounter of the exact antigen and the antibody that uh, had been produced. So, do, and this is actually talking about your immune responses, uh, immuno, immunological memory. When you encounter something the first time, it's called the primary immune response. When you encounter something that the body is going to identify as a pathogen, um, that's something that can make you sick. The first time is called the body response with the primary immune response. This uh, leads to cell proliferation and differentiation with that very first antigen exposure. There's a lag period of about three to six days. So if, the, if you're becoming extremely ill over this time, theoretically someone could die before their bodies even had a chance to, to produce enough antibody to neutralize the pathogen. Now the peak levels of antibody is about 10 days. So that's, you can be sick for quite a while before your body develops the peak level of antibody. Then there's what's called the secondary immune response. This would be re-exposure to the same antigen. It's much faster, it more prolonged, lasts a lot longer, and it's a more effective response. This, now when we look at this, we're really, I like to think of when you get a vaccination. So a vaccination actually contains a weakened or killed, um, or even just a part of an antigen, a weakened or killed pathogen, or a toxin, inactivated toxin, or even some part of an antigen that is given to the body, the first time that you're giving, you're, given the, you're introduced to that antigen, that this is your primary immune response. It occurs after a little delay. These are days, time and days along the x-axis. And then it kind of wanes, it kind of lags off. So that's uh, when, if, if this is a vaccination, you're going to need what they call a booster. So you may, if you have had, for example, the hepatitis B vaccine um, to prevent getting hepatitis B, um, and everybody who works in healthcare is required to have these vaccinations, you have to have a series of three of them. So the first response, it, it peaks not quite, you know, at a certain point, and then it goes down. But then you get your booster, and the immune response is very strong, it goes even higher, and then it lasts a long time, a lot longer. Okay, so um, this is showing you the secondary immune response, faster and larger. Now they're showing you the primary immune response to antigen B is going to be similar, so they're just showing you another antibody is introduced over here. So when B cells encounter antigens, they make a specific antibody. There's two types. Naturally acquired is due to bacterial or viral infection. You get sick with this one. Artificially acquired is due to the vaccine, the one, the example that I just talked about, where the body is introduced to the pathogen, but the pathogen is not able to make you sick. It's considered weakened or killed, or nowadays they can actually um, genetically um, build 
an antigen. So there's no chance that you get that infection. It's just the part of that pathogen that the body responds to in a vaccine. Vaccines are dead or weakened pathogens or just the isolated antigenic determinant. These spare us the symptoms of a primary response um, or death to um, encountering the actual pathogen. You actually do get a primary response with the vaccine, but it's not the full pathogen that can really make you sick or kill you. Passive humoral immunity is when ready-made antibodies are introduced into the body. The B cells, your B cells are not challenged by antigens. You're actually given the antibody that uh, had been produced by another organism or genetically um, made in the lab. Therefore, immunological memory does not occur. Passive immunity is delivered to you through two different ways, through the human body. Naturally, with babies that are um, breastfeeding, they actually, and also prenatally, antibodies are delivered to that fetus via the placenta, and then after birth, the newborn will um, through breast milk. And there are actually antibodies in that that will protect the baby from any uh, pathogen that the mother herself is immune to. Artificially acquired is when um, someone is um, possibly they're exposed to some kind of a very deadly pathogen, um, and you can actually and they've actually been able to isolate the gamma globulin or the antibody to that particular pathogen. They can give that person the um, the serum that contains that gamma globulin from another source, so that it'll protect you just very short term from becoming very sick uh, due to that pathogen. So this is showing you humoral antibody-mediated immunity. Active, naturally acquired when you actually get the infection uh, with via contact with the pathogen. And then artificially acquired, the vaccine given uh, is actually dead or attenuated pathogens or part of that antigen. And the body actually develops its own antibody. Passive, this is naturally acquired antibodies passed from mother to the fetus via the placenta or to the infant uh, via her milk. And also uh, artificially acquired the injection of exogenous antibodies. That means antibodies obtained from a source outside of your own body, from a different source. And they call that gamma globulin. And that is the end of part A. And we will begin the next lecture. This is uh, slide 59. Uh, part B of the immune system. Have a great day.